In this video, we'll look at one of the bigger success stories of reinforcement learning, the story of AlphaGo. In 2016, AlphaGo, a Go playing computer developed by the company DeepMind, beat top-level Go player Lee Sedol. A breakthrough many AI researchers were convinced was at least decades away. First, a little bit of intuition about how Go works. The rules are very simple. There are two players, black and white, and they move one after another, placing stones on a 19 by 19 grid. The aim of the game is to have as many stones on the board when no more stones can be placed. The only way to remove stones is to encircle your opponent. So the game largely consists of a tension between trying to build a long line of stones that encircle some stones of your opponent while ensuring that your opponent doesn't do the same for your stones. So why is this so difficult? And what is it that AlphaGo has done to finally solve those issues? Before we go into that, let's look at some claims that were made in the media. When the win against Lisa Dole was publicized, many claims were made, some by DeepMind themselves, and here are some of them. All of these claims here are dubious for various reasons. Starting at the top, AlphaGo was sometimes hailed as an important move towards general purpose AI. This is, a this is overselling things a little bit. AlphaGo is very much purpose-built for Go. It's not an architecture that can be translated one-on-one -on -one to any other games, and Go has some features that are exploited in a very specific way. DeepMind has projects that are impressive milestones towards general purpose AI, and it's also true that projects like Deep Blue, the chess computer that beat Kasparov, were filled with hand-coded chess knowledge written with the help of experts. This is not true for AlphaGo. Only the rules of Go were hard-coded into it, and it learned everything else by simply observing existing matches and playing against itself. Nevertheless, it can play Go and nothing else. Another claim often made was that AlphaGo thinks and learns in a human way. Now AlphaGo learns, and its thinking is probably more human than Deep Blue's, but we don't understand human thinking well enough to make this claim at all. Another claim was that AlphaGo mimics the human brain. Now we know that AlphaGo uses convolutional neural networks, but, we also, but we've also seen in previous lectures that neural networks are only very loosely inspired by actual brain architectures. And the word neural in the phrase neural networks should very much be taken with a grain of salt. It's also said that Go has more possible positions than there are atoms in the universe, and that that's why it's so difficult. Now this is true on the face of it, but it's also true of chess. This is true, but it's also true of chess. And there are more positions in Go than there are in chess, that, but that's not actually why it's so much more difficult. What makes Go difficult and more difficult than chess is more than just the size of its state space. One thing that was pointed to is the high branching factor. At every point in a Go game, there's a possibility of making as many as 100 moves, and that is certainly part of the thing that makes Go a difficult game to analyze. Essentially, it gives us a very broad game tree, but it's only part of the problem. The second aspect is that in Go, you have to wait very long to see a payoff. In chess, a basic tactic will require thinking perhaps five or six moves ahead. By that time, you will usually have captured something and it will be clear that the tactic worked or it didn't. In Go, if you're encircling a big group of stones, that can take tens of moves, even if your opponent doesn't get in your way. That means not only do you have a very wide game tree, with lots of possible moves, you also need to look very deep into the game tree to see if your current action is going to have a payoff. And that's what makes Go so difficult. And it's an important factor in explaining why DeepMind solved it the way they did. The standard approach to solving these kinds of two-player games is an algorithm called Minimax. In Minimax, we simply explore the whole game tree, either to a fixed depth or to the leaf nodes, where one party has won and the other has lost. And then, like we did in the Q-learning example, we walk the values of the leaf nodes back up the tree. This algorithm is mostly useless when it comes to Go. For each node in the tree, there are up to 361 children, compared to about 30 for chess. This means you get almost 17 billion terminal nodes if we just search two turns deep. And as we discussed, you actually need to search very deep to find the nodes that show you clear rewards. One alternative 
that was an early success in Go playing was the use of rollouts. We start at the current state and we simply choose moves at random and play a few full games for each immediate successor to our current state. We then average the rewards we get over these as a value for all of the successor states we have access to and choose the action that leads to the highest value. The rollout policy, the policy that we're sampling values from, should ideally give good moves, high probability, but also be very, very fast to compute so that we can easily sample a large number of rollouts quickly. An extension of this principle was the Monte Carlo tree search algorithm. This is a simple but effective algorithm combining rollouts with an incomplete tree search. We essentially start with a single node representing our current state, and we expand the part of the search tree that we have access to step by step. We start with an unexpanded root node labeled 0 over 0, and this value represents the probability of winning from the given state. We then iterate the following algorithm. We first select an unexpanded child node. At first, this will be the root node, but once the tree is further expanded, we select one of the leaf nodes. We expand that node and give its children the value 0 over 0. We then simulate, which means that from each node we expand, we do a rollout, and then we backpropagate. This has nothing to do with backpropagation we know from neural networks. We simply take the information we learned from the rollout and work it back up the network. For the newly expanded node and every one of its parents, we update its values into a new fraction. The numerator is the number of rollouts won by ancestors of that node, and the denominator is the total number of rollouts played for ancestors of that node. So in this slide, we have a partially expanded tree, and we can tell from the root node that in, that in total 21 rollouts have been performed, and in 12 of those, we have one. The leftmost child of the root node has been involved in 10 of these rollouts, and 7 of these have been won. In the expansion step, we pick a random leaf. In the expansion step, we pick a random leaf and expand one of its child nodes, which is initialized with a value 0 over 0, indicating that 0 rollouts have been started from this node. We perform one rollout. And in this case, we lose it. So the value of the just expanded node is updated to 0 over 1. And the value of its direct parent changes from 3 over 3 to 3 over 4. Previously, 3 out of the 3 rollouts from this node had been successful. And now, 3 out of 4 of the rollouts from this node have been successful. The basic idea of AlphaGo is to train both a policy network and a value network and to integrate these into the Monte Carlo tree search algorithm. The neural networks look like this. On the left, we see the policy network, which maps the state of the board to an action space, much like our tic-tac-toe example did in the previous videos. And the value network maps the state of the board to a value, essentially how good this particular board position is for us. And here's how AlphaGo put all of this together. It started with imitation learning, so training the policy and the value network simply from a large database of Go games. These were then further trained in a reinforcement learning by playing against both itself and previous iterations of itself, updating the weights of the neural networks by policy gradients. And then, when the time comes to use the trained neural network in an actual game, the policy network and the value network are embedded in a Monte Carlo tree search algorithm. As in basic MCTS, the value on each node represents an estimate of the probability that black will win from that state. Then, when it comes time to do the rollouts, the policy network is used for this. And AlphaGo, in fact, contains two high-quality policy network that is used for the first T steps, and then a faster policy network that is used to finish the game. From this, a value is derived for the newly opened node, and the value of this node is backed up as it is in standard Monte Carlo tree search. Each node's value becomes an estimate of the probability of a win from that state. A year later, DeepMind introduced AlphaGo Zero. And here they were able to show that they could also learn from scratch. Purely by self-play, with no imitation learning and no domain knowledge inserted, they showed that purely by self-play, they could train policy networks that were able to achieve superhuman performance on three games, Go, 
chess and the Japanese variant of chess called shogi. And AlphaGo Zero used three main tricks to simplify and improve on the original AlphaGo. And these are the main tricks. They combined the policy and the value nets into a single network. They viewed, they viewed Monte Carlo tree search as a policy improvement operator. And they added residual connections and batch normalizations. General tricks for improving the performance that were introduced after the original AlphaGo. Let's start with the first one. The input to both the policy and the value net is a state. This means that we can build a network where the first few layers are shared, which then bifurcates into a policy prediction and a value prediction. And doing this allows the first layers of the neural network to receive a signal both from the policy training and from the value training. This means that these layers, which generally simply build up a higher level representation of the board, get a richer training signal. The second insight was that you can view Monte Carlo Tree Search as a policy improvement operator. If you start with a given policy, let's say a neural network, then that policy gives you a next action in the current state. But you can also use it inside of a Monte Carlo Tree Search, and the result of that algorithm is also an action for the current state, and almost certainly a better one. Therefore, what we're essentially doing is taking an existing policy network, comparing the raw predictions from that network to those produced by the network plus the Monte Carlo tree search, and then updating the network to mimic the outcome of the Monte Carlo tree search. And once the network has learned to do so, we can take that new and improved network and train it again to mimic the better policy produced by integrating the network inside Monte Carlo tree search. The third trick was simply to take some of the improvements that had emerged for training neural networks in the years following AlphaGo and to integrate them into the policy and the value networks. The first was the use of residual connections. This is a very simple idea. If you have a number of layers whose input and output are the same size, then you can simply draw a connection around those layers and sum the input to the layers to their output. And this can help a lot with the problem of vanishing gradients. If the gradient signal through these two layers isn't very strong, then we are essentially extending it with another gradient signal that bypasses these two layers. And we can use the first signal that bypasses the layers to start the learning for the bottom layers of the network while the network slowly learns to conquer the vanishing gradients through the two layers. The second addition was batch normalization which is essentially a form of standardization, which is this operation that we saw in the fourth lecture. The idea is that we do this not for our input data, but halfway through the network. We simply look at our current batch, we compute the mean and the standard deviation, and we standardize the values in the batch on the fly. And this ensures that even if our neural network weights aren't entirely properly initialized, after the batch norm, the values of our network still have the shape of a standard normal distribution which, as we saw in previous lectures, is good for learning. And combining all these tricks, DeepMind showed that AlphaGo Zero could, within less than five days of training time, improve on the performance of the version that beat Lee Sedol. And like I said, versions for Chess and Shogi were also trained, which were eventually able to match or beat the performance of the then best available commercial applications for these games. So that's it for AlphaGo. The final video of this lecture will be our final social impact video. We'll look at some of the principles from this lecture and the previous lecture on recommender systems and see what the development of these technologies means in terms of social impact.